Well, thank you very much uh, for the invitation to speak. Uh, it's, a, it's a real pleasure. Um, I'm involved in the Royal Society of Biology in the London branch, uh, and I always enjoy these events. Um, so I'm going to talk about energy and matter at the origin of life, and it's it's a big subject. I'm going to try and cover as much as I can in about 50 minutes or so, but it's changed tremendously in the last in the last 10 years or so. It's gone really from being a subject that was really only taken seriously by chemists, um, from really from the, the Miller-Urey experiment that many people will have heard of in the 1950s. Uh, it's been a question in in synthetic chemistry. How do you make the nucleotide building blocks for DNA, this kind of thing, as uh, under prebiotic chemistry? Uh, and in the last 10 years, really with the uh, advent of phylogenetics and a lot of comparative biochemistry, a lot has changed in that time. So I'd like to go back to the framing of the question, uh, going back to Schrodinger um, in, in his famous book, What is Life in 1944? So about 75 years ago. And my, um, my reading of his book really said there are two important aspects that we need to consider if we're thinking about life. The one of them was genes and um, information. And this was really the first time, to my knowledge, that words like code script were used in biology. So this whole informational underpinning of biology, which has become so familiar to us, was really introduced during the Second World War um, by physicists who are interested in, um, in, in, in encryption and coding and so on, and thinking about information in those terms and thinking about life in those terms. And I think Schrodinger's um, presentation of the question is, still sounds quite modern to me. He wrote chromosomes containing some kind of code script, the entire pattern of the individual's future development and of its functioning in the mature state. But he also talked about entropy, quite a lot about entropy. Um, and there his terms feel to me quite antiquated he was talking about life feeding on negative entropy uh, and he says the device by which an organism maintains itself stationary at a fairly high level of orderliness really consists in continually sucking orderliness from its environment and 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 this is a phraseology that i don't think you'd ever hear a biologist using uh, sucking orderliness from the environment i really have no idea what he had in mind when he when he wrote that but he did in the second edition he did have a footnote where he said if i had been catering for physicists alone i should have let the discussion turn on free energy instead uh, and that was really all all he said there um, and it would be interesting to know what else he had in mind there. But essentially, when we're, when we're talking about free energy, then biologists are much more on home ground, at least I am. Um, so what is free energy? Well, it's basically simply the, 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 the energy which is available to power work. Um, so not dissipated as heat in various reactions, work such as muscle contraction, um, or, or really anything going on in any biochemical machinery in the cell where ATP is being hydrolyzed to power that work. All our energy uh, comes from, in, in, in humans, in animals generally, comes from effectively burning food in oxygen, so from respiration. Um, and we are generating heat or entropy in the environment, um, but a proportion for a period at least of the free energy is conserved as ATP. And it's worth pointing out that there's nothing particularly special about the bonds in ATP, which is, you can see down here at the bottom. Um, it's cycling continuously between ADP, adenosine diphosphate, uh, and, and inorganic phosphate, and ATP, adenosine triphosphate. So that's what you're seeing here. So this phosphate group is being broken off and added on, hydrolyzed, and then, and then condensed back on again. It's really the power uh, that's coming from ATP is from how far that ratio has been driven from equilibrium. So it's about 10 orders of magnitude from equilibrium. Um, there, there is enormously more ATP in cells than ADP. If you simply, you know, if a cell dies, then, then the ATP will break down to ADP almost completely uh, in, in a matter of hours. So, if we take this idea seriously, that life is, in some sense, the two most important underpinning principles of life are genes and information, which, uh, which I don't have a great deal new to say about, and energy, free energy flow. 
Um, the first question we should ask is, is there a universal form of energy conservation across living things? And the answer is yes, there is, but it's a strange one and is one that Schrodinger himself didn't know about. This uh, really came with Peter Mitchell uh, 20 years or so after, after uh, Schrodinger himself. So it's the use of ion gradients such as proton gradients uh, across membranes to power growth and, uh, and basically all of biochemistry. These, this simple idea of proton gradients across membranes, and I'll say more about them in a moment, but it's, it's important to realize that they are as universal across life as the genetic code itself. All cells, all bacteria, all archaea, with a few fiddling exceptions that ferment only, um, but there are also a few fiddling exceptions to the genetic code. Um, all life is powered this way. So it is fundamental. And here's roughly how it works. Uh, I'm just going to present it as a, basically as a cartoon. Uh, this is what's happening in you right now. It's also what happens in bacteria across the plasma membrane of bacteria. So these are the mitochondria that you can see. I'm not sure if you can see my cursor or not. Can, can, well, yes, I'll, we can see it. Yes, yeah. Okay, great. So, so these are the Christie membranes in, in the mitochondria. Um, and, and this bar across the bottom is supposed to represent one of the Christie membranes. These red balls are the proteins, and I'll show you what they actually look like in a moment, but these are uh, large multi-subunit proteins embedded in this membrane. Uh, so they're membrane integral proteins. Uh, and electrons are being stripped from food in the form of NADH, but we can really see it most simply just as electrons. And they're being passed ultimately to oxygen um, uh, uh, and teaming up with some protons to form water. So we have a current of electrons streaming from food to oxygen. That current of electrons is powering the extrusion of protons across the membrane. So we end up with effectively a reservoir of protons. Um, I'm simplifying grotesquely, as anybody who here who knows about respiration will appreciate, these protons are not simply free in space. They're probably um, scuttling along the membrane itself. There's a lot that we don't know still about respiration. But in effect, we have a reservoir of protons on this side. And it's the flow of protons through this turbine, and it more or less is a turbine, the ATP synthase, driving uh, the, the phosphorylation of ADP to ATP. This is the process which is being driven 10 orders of magnitude uh, from, from equilibrium. So it's the disequilibrium between food and oxygen in the atmosphere. Uh, the electrons are flowing to oxygen. That disequilibrium is powering the disequilibrium of protons across the membrane. That disequilibrium is powering the synthesis of ATP. And this is really fundamental right across all of life. We can see it in quite simple terms. Um, if you're not uh, entirely happy with biochemistry, it's really, it works pretty much like a hydroelectric dam. The, the reservoir itself is the proteins, uh, the protons on one side of the membrane, the, the dam is the membrane. And then the turbine, the ATP synthase, is the electrical turbine in the hydroelectric power plant. And it really is. This is an extraordinary um, extraordinary protein. It's a rotating motor. Um, the, you know, Sir John Walker got the Nobel Prize for this um, back in 1997 for working out the structure really only of the head groups here. We still don't have a completely clear idea of what's happening within the membrane itself, how the proton uh, influx through 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 the membrane here um, powers the rotation. We have ideas; there are good hypotheses, but we 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 still don't know in detail exactly how that that happens. But plainly, this is a remarkable a, a remarkable machine, um, an engine, uh, and it's plainly got nothing to do with the origin of life. Uh, and the pumps themselves, this is uh, complex one of the respiratory chain, one of these red blobs that I showed you in the membrane. Uh, Judy Hurst has one of the most recent structures. This is a mammalian complex one. Uh, you can see the membrane, uh, the inner membrane, the mitochondrial membrane, the Christi down here. And this is really a kind of a tank-like um, protein. It's enormous um, uh, and extremely complex. And we don't really know Again, there are hypotheses, but we don't really know exactly how uh, uh, machines like the, the complex one pump protons across the membrane. Now, so if, if proton gradients across membranes are universal and they're fundamental, but they require machinery as large and complex and sophisticated as this, which clearly are the product of genes and natural selection, 
uh, they cannot go back to the origin of life. So we're faced with a, an interesting dilemma here. And most people have turned away from it, as you can imagine, and, and, and simply reject chemiosmotic coupling and membrane bioenergetics as being plainly uh, products of evolution and not relevant to the origin of life. And so instead, over decades, we've had uh, people working on alternative sources of primal, primordial energy, lightning, for example. Most people will be familiar with the Miller-Urey experiment, which, which uh, was, was effectively using electrical discharges to simulate lightning. Um, UV radiation, um, and, and so terrestrial ponds uh, like, um, like, like these ones at Yellowstone, are the favored environment of chemists these days. And they're starting uh, with the chemistry that seems to work, starting with cyanide, with cyanoacetylene. So these are molecules with triple bonds in them, which already have a lot of energy stored within those bonds. Solvents very often, including things like formamide, using UV radiation or lightning, which have, in my mind, very little to do with biology, and things like wet-dry cycles. If you want to do dehydration reactions to make polymers, for example, like DNA or RNA, then the simplest way to extract water is to dehydrate. Uh, and if you're going to dehydrate, put things through a wet-dry cycle. The problem with all of this, in my mind, it, it works reasonably well as chemistry, but it looks nothing like life as we know it. Now, if you had this talk from one of the leading chemists uh, working in this area, they would not agree with much of what I'm going to tell you this evening. Um, and I, I have no real quarrel with the actual chemistry they've done. They've done beautiful chemistry. I, I do not in any way want to deride their work. But as a biochemist or as a biologist, um, I'm, I'm struck by this that there's essentially no resemblance between the chemistry that over decades has been done as origin of life chemistry uh, and biochemistry as I know it. And so um, substrates, for example, I mentioned cyanide, cyanamide, formamide, um, uh, polyaromatic hydrocarbons. Sometimes these are delivered from outer space, so they've become known as buckyballs from outer space. Uh, solvents, instead of simply just water, we, we, we take your pick, formamide, silicate gel, supercritical water, and I mentioned wet dry cycles. Catalysts include things like iron pyrites or borate or zinc sulfide, again, things that I do not associate with life generally. Reaction pathways. Um, Probably the most prominent model now is what's known as cyanosulfidic proto-metabolism, and a great deal of biochemistry can be captured by this. Uh, it's just that the pathways themselves, the substrates, the energy coupling and so on, don't look anything like biochemistry. Uh, and this energy coupling I've mentioned, UV radiation, heat, lightning, zinc sulfide photosynthesis, proton radiation. There's, there's lots of you know, very clever, very wacky ideas out there but they don't really answer the question about the origin of life, at least not life as we know it, because really what is being invented here is life as we do not know it, as some unnatural form of life which uh, doesn't resemble life as, as biologists are familiar with it. So what can we do? And, and, and in any case, there is a philosophical question here. Can life itself tell us anything about its own origin? Um, or do we really need to believe the chemists who say, okay, we can, can, we, can, we can synthesize all the building blocks of life. This gave rise to genes and then genes invented metabolism as we know it. And there's no way we can reconstruct back before genes to the origin of chemistry. Well, there's one nice, I think rather beautiful and rather simple philosophical argument from Christian de Duve, a Nobel prize winning biologist, um, who thought a lot about the origin of life. And, and he, he, he started thinking about these questions really after he'd retired almost as a, uh, as, as, as a practicing biochemist. Uh, and he thought about these questions and thought in, in, a, in, a, in a very, very joined up way. And I don't agree with him about everything, but uh, he's certainly one of the most interesting people to read on, on this question. And he, he phrased this question, how did proto-metabolism come to be replaced by metabolism? How do you go from geochemistry to biochemistry, if you like? And he says the obvious answer to this question is that the appearance of catalysts, whether ribozymes or protein enzymes or both, was responsible for the transition. So we, we, we go from geochemistry to biochemistry with the advent of biological catalysts. And we have to ask how catalysts with appropriate properties came to appear. Um, 
they can't just be plucked out with the wrong properties. And he says the only scientifically plausible explanation is that catalysts arose through selection. And it's very difficult to disagree with him on that. When he says scientifically plausible, I suppose what he's, he was he was raised as a Catholic. Uh, he was always uh, very sensitive to to religion, um, but was also um, keen to have a naturalistic basis for the origin of life. So the only scientifically plausible explanation is that catalysts arose through selection. And his key point, which I put in red at the bottom, is that enzymes are selected only if they fit into proto-metabolism. In other words, if you're catalyzing some flux that exists anyway, in other words, biochemistry does geochemistry, but better. And I think that's a key, a key insight. So how can we get at the kind of geochemical environment that might have favored the origins of biochemistry? Well, this is where phylogenetics has come into play and one of the leading um, thinkers and phylogeneticists on this subject over the last uh, couple of decades has been Bill Martin. And this was a tree, a kind of conceptual tree that he did uh, about 20 years ago, back in 1999. Uh, and there's only a couple of things I really want you to notice on, on here. We are eukaryotes, as I'm sure you'll all know. Uh, the green lines here are plants uh, and algae and so on. Uh, these, this is from an endosymbiosis uh, between cyanobacteria and a, a eukaryotic host cell, giving rise to uh, photosynthetic eukaryotes. But notice down here we have another endosymbiosis, in this case between a bacterium or a, po a population of bacteria, which gave rise to the mitochondria, and an archaeal host cell, so an archaeon or a population of archaea that acquired endosymbionts. And when Bill um, drew this tree in the first place, this was really pushing the boundaries. I don't think many people would have agreed with him at the time. I certainly found it radical and sh quite shocking. But over the last 20 years, with a lot more full genome sequences, especially in bacteria and archaea, uh, it's basically been sustained. And now it would be more or less a mainstream view that eukaryotes arose in some kind of a, an endosymbiosis between an archaeal host cell, something like the Loki archaeota, the Asgard superphyla, uh, and, and, and a bacterial endosymbiont. So that means, for our purposes, that the eukaryotes are irrelevant to the origin of life. We, we can simply rule them out from any thinking. And that means the common ancestor of all of life, Luca, the last universal common ancestor, was the common ancestor of bacteria and archaea. And, and Bill here has them emerging separately uh, from a hydrothermal vent. That's still quite a radical idea. Um, uh, but the reason for it, uh, he had good reasons for proposing that. And you, you may or may not want to agree with him. But here are the reasons. And I'm just going to encapsulate very briefly um, what he had in mind. Bacteria and archaea plainly do share a common ancestor uh, because we, they share a lot of traits including the universal genetic code, including ribosomes, the protein building factories, including most of the genes involved in informational processing in cells, so the genes for transcription and translation and so on, um, and, and a lot of intermediary metabolism, so the Krebs cycle, not all of it, but, 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 but bits and pieces of the Krebs cycle, things like glycolysis, um, but not all of glycolysis either. Uh, gluconeogenesis and, and so on. And membrane bioenergetics, both the bacteria and the archaea um, are pretty much obligately um, generating their ATP from membrane bioenergetics using an ATP synthase. But the differences between bacteria and archaea are, are, are really quite striking. Um, the membrane is different. It's not different in its biophysical properties, but it's different in the chemistry, um, right down to the um, the stereoisomers of the glycerol phosphate head groups in, uh, in, in phospholipids. Uh, they are different in bacteria and archaea, along with most of the lipid synthesis enzymes, along with the cell wall. Again, they serve as a structurally similar purpose, but the actual chemistry of the archaeal cell wall and the bacterial cell walls is rather different. Processes like glycolysis, the actual chemistry is conserved, but the genes are not. Even DNA replication, this is extremely shocking, really. The genes for transcription and translation are homologous in bacteria and archaea, but the genes for DNA replication, there's only one or two that clearly share a common ancestor, and the rest are either extremely diverged or they arose independently, and there isn't a consensus view on that yet. And things like respiratory chains, responsible for generating the proton gradients I've been talking about, 
Um, it's difficult to tell if they are similar or different because there's been a lot of lateral gene transfer which can confound this kind of picture. But we're left with a serious question here about what kind of a cell was Luca, the last universal common ancestor. It's quite a paradoxical uh, situation. I like paradoxes. Uh, I, I have a quote here from Niels Boer who said, how wonderful that we have met with a paradox. Now we have some hope of making progress. Uh, I, I think it's, uh, it, it can really focus the mind on how do you solve a problem if you can find a good paradox. And here's one. Membrane bioenergetics are universal, but the membranes themselves are not. How can we go about thinking about this problem? Well, the paradox could be resolved if life originated in an environment where there were geological proton gradients. Is there such a place? Yes, it was discovered two decades ago now. Um, there have been a few more of these kind of vent systems discovered since then. So this is Lost City uh, hydrothermal field. It was discovered by Deb Kelly in the year 2000. Uh, and here she's holding a lump of a black smoke event, the kind of vent that most people are familiar with, where you can see the chimney, and a piece of uh, this Lost City, uh, one of these vents. And it looks a little bit like a mineralized sponge. And you can see there isn't black smoke belching out of these events. They're, 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 these are, are active vents, um, but the, the, the fluids themselves uh, are not precipitating out in the same way as they do from, from black smokers. So they are venting, but more slowly, uh, cooler, uh, they're warm rather than really hot um, and, and, and different in, in many respects. They're formed from a completely different process. So they're formed, in fact, from the reaction between water, which will percolate down beneath the sea floor, uh, uh, five or six kilometers down beneath the sea floor, where it will react with minerals, what are known as mafic minerals, so rich in magnesium and, and, and iron, um, and, um, and low in silicate. So things like olivine, and a lot of the mantle is made up of olivine. So water will react with olivine, um, and, and, and that generates an exothermic reaction, it generates heat, it generates alkaline fluids um, and uh, lots of hydrogen gas. And these kind of conditions, we should see them, we know, I mean, we see them a lot on the Earth, but we should see them essentially on any wet rocky planet or moon. And it now turns out that we do. Um, these kind of reactions possibly generate the methane that is occasionally detected at low levels on Mars. But this is perhaps more interesting, this is Enceladus, uh, there are plumes that Cassini detected these plumes coming out from cracks in the ice uh, on Enceladus. So uh, Enceladus is one of the moons of Saturn. It's got a large liquid ocean under about five kilometers worth of ice. Uh, and that ocean is, is, is kilometers deep. Um, and these plumes appear to be um, going out into space by distances of a couple of hundred kilometers. Uh, and they're alkaline and they're hydrogen rich. And they have gases like methane in there as well and some organic molecules. Uh, and and this, these kind of things can't really be explained by anything other than uh, this reaction between rock and water going on, presumably down underneath the oceans on Enceladus. Similar things seem to be happening on Europa as well. So even in our own solar system, there's plenty of evidence for this process of serpentinization generating these hydrothermal vents. Uh, so, so Enceladus would be the place that I would be most interested in looking for signs of life in our own solar system. So these vents were, dis were, were predicted to exist about 10 years before they were discovered by Mike Russell. Uh, and this was a feature that Nature did on him in 2006, where they photoshopped him up as Erasmus, as the Renaissance man. And they called him Naissance man, Naissance as in the birth of life. Uh, and, and this is the reactor that he built at uh, the Jet Propulsion Laboratory in, in Caltech. Uh, and, and this is a, a, a lump of Lost City uh, behind him, also photoshopped in. I'm afraid he doesn't have a lump like that. Uh, and this is a cross section. I mentioned that it looks a little bit like a mineralized sponge. Uh, and you can see here that it's, it's basically a labyrinth of interconnected pores. Now, the key points that Mike Russell drew attention to when he predicted this kind of system should exist is that there should be high concentrations of hydrogen gas bubbling in these fluids. The early oceans should have been much richer in CO2 than modern oceans are, uh, and therefore mildly acidic. We're adding CO2 to the oceans today and we're acidifying the oceans. But if back at the origin of life, think um, probably thousands of fold more CO2 than we have today, possibly even an atmosphere of one bar or above of CO2. So mildly acidic oceans under those conditions, pH 5 to 6. 
difficult to constrain, but that's uh, what most geologists would, would say. So we have acidic oceans and alkaline fluids which are mixing in this labyrinth of micropores. Uh, and so we should have proton gradients, pH gradients, across some of these barriers within these. Now, again, in the absence of oxygen four billion years ago, these minerals would have been different. The ocean chemistry would have been different. We would expect to see iron sulfide minerals in these walls in a way that we don't today at Lost City. Would we really? Who knows? There are no fossil vent systems like that, and it's very, very difficult to get at it. But, but basic chemistry says that's what we should be seeing. And that's really what, what caught my imagination, um, because here is a, a pore in a hydrothermal vent. I've simplified it about as much as is possible to do. We have an inorganic barrier. We have ocean waters percolating into this vent. Don't think that this is the edge of the vent where somewhere inside the vent here. So we've got acidic ocean waters percolating in. We have alkaline hydrothermal fluids also wending their way through these pores. And so we have alkaline interior, acidic exterior, and, and a pH gradient across a barrier here. And that barrier probably contains iron sulfur minerals, among other things. And here's the topology of a bacterial cell. So we have an iron pump in the membrane. You could think of this as something like complex one that we were talking about before, but there are simpler forms of these pumps as well. It's pumping out protons um, and sodium ions and all kinds of other things, but protons are the one that we're really interested in here. Um, and, and so uh, it's relatively alkaline inside, it's relatively acidic outside. The difference is about three pH units. If you convert the uh, uh, electrical potential into pH units, it's around about three pH units. Uh, in both cases, potentially. Uh, and the polarity is the same. It's acidic outside, alkaline inside. So at least there's an interesting topological analogy here. The question is, is there any way that you could go from here to here? Is there? Can we read more into this or am I just waving my arms and saying, oh, look, it's, uh, it's, it's a bit similar. I, I could see the head of Christ in the cloud or something and, 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 and think that I've seen something meaningful. Am I doing that here or is there something really meaningful? Well, I want to go back to Peter Mitchell himself, uh, and this is with Jennifer Moyle in the late 1940s. Jennifer Moyle, incidentally, did pretty much all the experiments. Mitchell himself was cack handed in the lab, and Moyle was extremely good in the lab uh, and a very clear thinker as well. And I don't think she had nearly as much credit as she deserved. Uh, Mitchell went on to win the Nobel Prize by himself. And a lot of the theory was coming from Mitchell, but a lot of the experiments that demonstrated the theory was correct were coming from Jennifer Moyle. Uh, and if she hadn't done that, he certainly wouldn't have won any Nobel Prizes. Um, Mitchell himself, though, was thinking back in, in the 1950s. This is from a conference in Moscow on the origin of life in 1957. Uh, and, and he said, I cannot consider, sorry, I've got my thing over that. I cannot consider the organism, and here think about bacteria, Without its environment, from a formal point of view, the two may be regarded as equivalent phases between which dynamic contact is maintained by the membranes that separate and link them. So he's talking about a very thin biological membrane, five nanometers thick, with equivalent phases on either side. One phase is the cell itself, and the other phase is the environment. And it's a very radically different way, really, of thinking about uh, the environment in relation to biology as equivalent phases. Um, so that's how he was conceiving it. And what he was really thinking about initially was a very, very simple question, which is how do bacteria keep the outside out and the inside in, in effect? How do you, how do you have a difference between these two phases? How, how does a living cell differ from its environment? Um, and and uh, in the simple way that we've been thinking about, well, they're pumping protons out in this particular case. And, it, and he realized it costs energy. You have to be selective, as selective an, as an enzyme, this seems obvious to us today, but in, in the 1940s, 1950s, uh, membrane pumps were not understood in anything like the level that they are now. Um, so you have to select whatever it is you're finding with the precision of an enzyme, and you have to pump it out, and that's going to cost energy. Uh, and, and he realized, of course, if you allow the outside to flow back in through one of these pumps, then in principle, at least you could you could conserve some of the energy that's now being released as things flow back in. And he made the mental leap from how bacteria um, keep their outside out 
uh, to how respiration works. He knew it needed a membrane. He knew there were there, were, there, there was uh, protons potentially involved in 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 in, in that, and, and made the mental leap to this is how ATP could be synthesized. So it's a it's a huge leap there, a, a leap of genius really. But but what he was thinking about was was uh, was a very simple system. Now, I've mentioned on a few occasions ATP, and I think it misled me. Uh, and perhaps has misled the field for quite some time. Because if we go back to these very early cells, the kind of cells that live today in hydrothermal vents and the kind of cells that you see in the deepest branches of the tree of life, they're things like methanogens and acetogens. Methanogens are archaea, acetogens are bacteria. Uh, and they both live from the reaction between CO2 and hydrogen gas, so gases. In the case of methanogens, they make methane. In the case of acetogens, they make acetic acid or vinegar acetate uh, and overall that reaction the it releases energy free energy is the delta g naught prime so the standard free energy is minus 131 kilojoules per mole or minus 104 the only thing you really need to notice is minus that means it's releasing energy um, to to generate these things this is the only pathway of co2 fixation that's found in both bacteria and archaea and so it's probably the most ancient and ancestral and if we look at the core biochemistry of cells today, uh, and I'll, I'll just talk you through this quickly, um, we see here, for example, in, in brown, hydrogen, and then again, hydrogen. So we're starting with CO2, activated CO2 in this case, bound to a surface or bound to a protein or something. Um, you're reacting with hydrogen, with hydrogen again, with hydrogen again, and so on. But more hydrogen this way to, 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 make, um, to make an equivalent to acetyl-CoA then CO2 and hydrogen to make pyruvate, then more CO2 to make oxaloacetate. Notice I'm now already into Krebs cycle intermediates. These are this is reductive chemistry starting with hydrogen and CO2 and within a few steps, we're, we're into molecules that any, any biologist or biochemist I assume is familiar with, py pyruvic acid, oxaloacetic acid, alpha ketoglutarate, glutamate and so on. It's only a few steps and it's hydrogen and CO2 involved in all of these steps. From, from pyruvate, uh, we can get to glyceraldehyde and up to ribose uh, and so on. The, the blue arrows here are bio, uh, essentially prebiotic chemistry that has been done in the lab, not by me. I've done bits and pieces of this, but, but other groups working on these questions around the world, and there's more and more interest in this now. So the blue arrows are showing prebiotic chemistry that has been done. Uh, following essentially the pathways that life still uses uh, and has been achieved already. In the red boxes, these are the precursors for nucleotide synthesis. If you want to make RNA or you want to make DNA, you need first to make the nucleotides. And if you want to make the nucleotides following the biological pathways in the red boxes, this is your starting point. It's not very far from CO2 fixation. It's only a few steps, really, in most cases. But then to go on to make nucleotides is quite a few steps more. So it's, it's not an easy challenge. But it's something uh, it's been done, started with cyanide. It's been done with UV radiation and so on. It's never been done yet, uh, though I'll show you our own progress on this later on. It's, been, it, it's never been done yet following life as a guide to its own origin. In principle, it should work. And here's why. Um, this is theoretical thermodynamics from Jan Amund and Tom McCollum. Uh, and what you're seeing here is this is free energy again. The minus numbers mean it should happen spontaneously. And this is under the kind of alkaline hydrothermal conditions I was talking about. If you start with hydrogen and CO2 um, at temperatures of, say, 50 degrees centigrade and under alkaline conditions, you should get cells. Let me say that again, because it's quite hard to believe. If you start with hydrogen and CO2 and shake them up under those conditions, it's more stable to have cells. Cells are more stable than a mixture of two gases like hydrogen and CO2. That's, I mean, I find that really quite shocking. That's a thermodynamic statement. It doesn't mean if you shake up hydrogen and CO2, you're going to get cells. It simply means that that's a more stable energetic state. There's a kinetic barrier that stops it happening. Of all the materials within cells, amino acids are the easiest to make. They release the most energy. 
um, and they've been found in all kinds of different environments. Fatty acids are also relatively easy to make. Sugars, saccharides are not quite so easy. Zero means it's kind of borderline. It's, um, it, it's neither exergonic or endergonic. And nucleotides are up here. It costs energy to make nucleotides. But if you can save some of the energy that's released down here and, and pump, put it into making nucleotides, overall, uh, this is your energy status. So the, the beautiful thing here is that it should be possible to make cells starting with CO2 and hydrogen. And here's why it doesn't work. There is a kinetic barrier. You start with CO2 and you have to go uphill to get to formaldehyde um, up here. And then it's downhill all the way. So if you can just get past those first couple of steps, then, then this is the kind of the region where uh, biochemistry is happening. Modern cell biochemistry is just slightly exergonic compared to CO2 and hydrogen. It's much more exergonic if you're making methane down at the bottom there. So how do we reduce the scale of this barrier to hydrogen reacting with CO2? Methanogens use a proton gradient across the membrane to do it. So that seems to be perhaps the key here. And the reason why it works is that hydrogen is not reducing enough. It's not reactive enough to push its electrons onto CO2. Technically, with the reduction potential, um, it's, it's minus 420 millivolts or so, whereas to, to go from CO2 to formaldehyde is about minus 580. But all you really need to know is that any one pH, it's an uphill reaction. You have to put energy in, and it's not very easy to put that energy in. It's quite a lot of energy. It's an uphill reaction, and it's just not going to happen. But that's when you have hydrogen and CO2 at pH 7, or generally at the same pH. What we have in the vents is hydrogen at pH 11. And when it's at pH 11, if it pushes its electrons onto something else, the protons are left over and they will react immediately with the hydroxide ions at pH 11. And so that's thermodynamically favored. It means hydrogen is much more reactive at pH 11. And CO2, if it wants to pick up electrons, it's picking up a negative charge. If it's in an acidic environment, it can pick up a proton as well, and now it's received a hydrogen, and now it can pick up another electron, and another proton, and so on. So it's much easier to reduce CO2 in an acidic environment. And so the CO2 is coming with an acidic ocean, the hydrogen is coming with alkaline fluids, and that reaction should happen so long as they're effectively kept apart from each other, so long as they're in two phases, it should happen in vents. This is what methanogens are doing. They've got uh, an enzyme in, the, in a membrane bound enzyme called the energy converting hydrogenase. It's being driven by protons coming in. Uh, and so this whole thing is effectively driven by a pH difference across the membrane, which is driving the reaction between hydrogen and ultimately CO2. So this is fundamentally what the simplest cells are doing. We can forget about the ATP synthase. We can put it aside. They actually don't need that. They need this to grow. So um, I think I was misled by, by over 10 years or so thinking the real key lies in making ATP. I think the real key to proton gradients is that they facilitate this reaction between hydrogen and CO2 to make organic molecules, uh, which, which allows growth. And so you can imagine going in, a, in, a, in some kind of um, one of these pores in a hydrothermal vent with proton gradients across the barrier and uh, CO2 crossing the barrier, that those conditions are going to facilitate the formation of organic molecules. And if that kept on going, then topologically what you might end up with, and this is uh, hand-waving, but I'm going to show you that we have some experiments that suggest it's true. Um, you might have a protocell sitting in there with some of these iron sulfide minerals or, or, or clusters sitting in the membrane, driving organic synthesis inside these protocells. So how do we go about testing this hypothesis? I've been trying to do this for a long time. We set out with a kind of large reactor. We thought vents are big, so let's make a big reactor. Uh, it turned out to be a very unstable, unreliable, very difficult to replicate things. Uh, we, we, we tried precipitating all kinds of vent structures inside these reactors. Um, we got some interesting results, but they've been very difficult to replicate our own results. And so we changed to microfluidic chips uh, some years ago. So this is, uh, this is a, a microfluidic chip where we have acidic flow on one side, alkaline flow on the other side. We can precipitate a barrier between them. And then we can try to look to see, this is under the microscope, are we, can we use this setup uh, to reduce CO2 using hydrogen? 
I've had some success, but not nearly as much as a, a former PhD student of mine who has nailed this uh, after he left my lab. Uh, he was kind enough to include me on his paper, uh, but uh, I actually had nothing to do with these experiments beyond uh, having tried to do it myself. Um, so what he showed, and he showed this with uh, NMR, uh, and rather beautifully, I won't go through the details because I think I've got about uh, 15 minutes or so uh, remaining to, to, to speak, and I'd like to cover the, 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 the results. Um, what it's showing, though, is that hydrogen uh, in alkaline conditions is passing its electrons potentially onto this barrier. We're not sure if it's of the electrons on the other side here. I'm showing other potential things that could be going on, and we've not really nailed that bit yet. But something is crossing this barrier, perhaps electrons, um, and reducing CO2 on the other side, which is picking up the protons from the acid on this side. So the electrons are coming from the hydrogen over here, which becomes water and the protons are coming from the acid acids on this side. And, and they've shown using uh, deuterated water and 13, so heavy, heavy carbon, 13C, um, that the electrons really are coming from, from the hydrogen and the protons really are coming from the acid and the CO2 really is coming from here. So that's all uh, really demonstrated. Only the first step to make formate and in, in a remarkably short period of time, this whole experiment lasted for six seconds. Um, and they got rather small amounts of formate. But in the absence of the pH gradient, it didn't work. In the absence of the barrier, it didn't work. In the absence of iron, it doesn't work, and so on. So they, they, they've shown very beautifully uh, that this is vectorial chemistry and that a, a pH gradient across the barrier will facilitate CO2 reduction. I've been interested in, is it really electrons or is it protons crossing that barrier? And, and we had let these experiments run much longer and then you get much thicker barriers that way. And, and one thing that struck us just in looking at these barriers, this was with a, a, with a pH indicator, um, that here's the barrier, but you also get these, this diffuse uh, precipitates forming as well. And you get inclusions of water within these precipitates as they form. And it, it was striking that the um, the fluid inclusions in, within this barrier are always mildly acidic. So this is, the, this is without a barrier at all, and you can see that it's acidic on this side. This is alkaline on this side, and you have a mixing zone with laminar flow, so no barrier but, but, but laminar flow. Uh, and you can see, again, a, a mixing zone. Uh, it can be quite tight, um, but always whenever we see the barrier, when we're, we're looking at what is the, the pH, the water inclusions in the barrier, it turns out to be acidic. And we looked at that a little bit more carefully. And here again, you can see this is the barrier, a diffuse barrier. Um, this is alkaline on, on, on one side, and it's acidic right up to the very edge there. So we did some stopped flow experiments uh, and measured the time it took for the alkaline channel to become acidic if we switched off the alkaline flow, or the acidic channel to become alkaline if we switched off the acidic flow, and so on. Um, and I have to say, this was messy work. Um, I'm not going to present the results in any detail, but from that we were able to calculate the, uh, the rate of flux of protons crossing the barrier relative to hydroxide ions going the other way. Uh, and it's a remarkable difference, in fact. Um, we were able to show that you get five pH units different across 70 micrometer distances here. Uh, and when we switched it off, when we switched off flow, uh, we were able to show that the proton flux across this barrier is two million fold faster. Uh, than the hydroxide ion flux going the opposite direction. And that means through calculations that there should be pH gradients as steep as three pH units, so a thousand fold difference in proton concentration across distances of a single, uh, a single nanocrystal of 25 nanometers, for example. So it's quite feasible that this kind of thing can work, that you can have protons crossing this barrier enormously faster than hydroxide ions. So, so far, this hypothesis has not yet collapsed completely. We tried to model it a little bit further and think about what do we need to be looking for. So this was a mathematical model, and I won't talk in any detail about it, but essentially what we imagined could happen is that on one side, you've got acidic ocean fluids. On the other side, we have alkaline fluids. We just pictured this as being kind of precariously wedged in, in the barrier itself, not because we think it's like that, but because that allows 50% of this membrane to be on the acidic side and 50% on the alkaline side. Um, we imagined that we would have a proto-ECH, just some kind of iron sulfur mineral crystal, something small, uh, collated by amino acids, the protons would reduce CO2 as they come in across this, this barrier to make organics. 
I showed you that the ones we would expect to form would be amino acids and fatty acids. We expect the fatty acids would go to the membrane and the amino acids would interact with these growing iron sulfur minerals and perhaps collate them and perhaps end up in the membrane. There's various positive feedback loops there and we were able to show, though I don't know whether it means anything, we were able to show basically that protocells in principle can grow and get better at growing through positive feedback loops along these lines. But there are some more fundamental problems with this. One of them is that we've got this protocell exposed to pH of, 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 of 5 to 7 on one side and 9 or 10 on the other side or, or maybe even more. So are fatty acid type protocells, are they capable of withstanding those conditions? And we're also proposing that amino acids should be able to interact with iron sulfides um, to generate something that could go to the membrane. So these were the first experimental questions that we wanted to, to ask. Are hydrothermal vents, these alkaline hydrothermal vents, way too harsh for the kind of fatty acid protocells, vesicles that we've been talking about? The conditions there, pH 5 to 12, temperature 50 to 100 degrees centigrade, salinity, modern ocean salinity, we assume, of around 600 millimolar, um, and plenty of divalent cations, which are known to play havoc with fatty acid membranes. Magnesium ions in modern oceans, about 50 millimolar, calcium ions, about 10 millimolar. So we wanted to subject um, protocells, these fatty acid vesicles, to those kind of conditions. And the literature says it doesn't work. Um, so we, but the literature is a bit purist. It starts with a single fatty acid, for example, um, decanoic acid. Um, and, and the experiments that have been done, this is some more work from Tom McCollum, uh, using what's called Fischer-Tropsch synthesis under hydrothermal conditions, starting with formate, they were able to produce a, a mixture of long chain hydrocarbons, including uh, fatty acids, so, uh, and, and fatty alcohols, alkanols and alkanoic acids. Uh, and this is the number of carbons in the chain, 9, 10, uh, 11, 12. Um, this is, uh, this, these are hydrocarbons, 15, 16, 17 carbons in the chain. So you can plainly get starting effectively with CO2 and hydrogen, which make formate as that first step. Um, these were under, uh, under hydrothermal conditions. You can make this mixture of fatty acids and fatty alcohols. So we used their mixtures, simple mixtures, uh, to see if we could make uh, protocells under those conditions. This is with decanoic acid alone, and the steep bit here is the only place where you see vesicles. Over here, it's too alkaline, they form micelles, there's no optical density. And over here, you get globs of, of fat, basically, in mildly acidic conditions. So you can get vesicles with decanoic acid alone, but only at pH 7 and under very, very mild conditions. But if you have this mix of six different fatty acids, we're beginning to open up this region where you're getting vesicles. And here as well, if we have a mixture of fatty acids and fatty alcohols, we're opening it up, we're beginning to see things around pH 9.5 to 10. And when we had a one-to-one -one mixture of fatty acids and fatty alcohols, we saw this weird messy graph here, which if it means anything at all, it tends to suggest that we have vesicles absolutely everywhere. The optical density is in this middle range here. So we looked, uh, we looked by cryo-electron microscopy and we looked by fluorescence microscopy, and these are harsh conditions. This is pH 12, 70 degrees centigrade, modern ocean salinity, 50 millimolar magnesium chloride and 10 millimolar calcium chloride. Uh, and, and here you see bilayer um, uh, enclosed vesicles. And here you can see them again, pH 12 and so on, similar conditions um, by, 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 by fluorescence microscopy. So it is possible to form these vesicles under these harsh range of conditions. What about interactions between amino acids uh, and iron sulfur clusters? Uh, again, we were really rather taken aback. Uh, it turns out that if you simply mix cysteine as a, as a monomeric amino acid with ferric iron, ferric chloride, and sodium sulfide in solution, um, you see the classic hump on UV vis spectroscopy that suggests a 4FE 4S cluster. Uh, and we've analyzed this in some length. We've looked as well at, uh, at Mossbauer spectroscopy, which is quite difficult to interpret, but basically what this is telling us, it depends on the cysteine concentration, and we're getting the biological iron sulfur clusters that you still see in proteins like ferrodoxin with just cysteine alone at pH 9, uh, and it's redox active, um, 
and we're, we're, we're looking more into the into whether or not it's capable of reducing co2 or not but again so two experiments there's a lot of work goes behind behind these they're both published if you're interested in looking but the, the 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 two predictions of that model which is that we should have robust membranes and we should have interactions between amino acids and iron sulfur clusters to generate iron sulfur clusters they're both true we don't know yet if they go to the membrane or if they reduce co2 so there's plenty more to be done but it's a it's a promising start just a couple more things i'd like to show you um we're thinking about uh, all of this biochemistry I showed you, nucleotide synthesis, for example. If, if life starts under these conditions, then this kind of chemistry has to start and follow the path that life follows. And, and here's what's going on uh, with uracil synthesis, for example. These are the, these are the steps uh, that life is following. Uh, and we've been looking under a wide range of conditions. Uh, so you can see here without catalysts, with various metal ions as catalysts, um, or across at the far side, um, this is looking at orotate and this is looking at dihydro uh, sorry this is, this this is forming uracil so this last these last two steps in the red box here is what this is looking at and we optimized the conditions under which this worked um, and we found that it works better at high pressure uh, at hot temperatures 90 degrees centigrade uh, in the presence of copper ions rather surprisingly uh, that's what you're seeing here um, and in, in, in high modern ocean salinity. So this is under the conditions where we initially are, are screens and these were where we optimize the conditions for uracil synthesis. Um, and we, we, this is a, whoops, sorry, this is a one pot synthesis uh, of orotate. So starting from over here with ammonia and carbonate, we're able to get uracil at low levels at the moment. We're trying to optimize that uh, and, and rather, rather higher amounts of orotate over here. So, uh, this is we're writing this up now um, uh, we've not solved everything this is just the base it's not the nucleotide itself so we've got some more work to do um, but again it's suggestive that these pathways which we still find in life can take place spontaneously in the absence of enzymes just with metal ion catalysts um, and and, uh, and under these kind of hydrothermal type conditions they do occur spontaneously and we can make uh, the, 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 the the basis uh, for, for nucleotides this is uh, some rather beautiful work from a PhD student who's just finished now. Um, uh, and this was looking at um, ATP synthesis in water in the absence of any enzymes like the ATP synthase, for example, just using um, a phosphorylating agent, acetyl phosphate, which is a two carbon phosphorylating agent, which is still used by life today. And, she, and we, we used a, a whole range. We use phosphate, cyclic trimetaphosphate, um, uh, trimetaphosphate itself, phosphoenol, pyruvate, pyrophosphate, uh, pyrophosphite, um, and carbon oil phosphate and acetyl phosphate. Uh, and really, only acetyl phosphate worked very well. The rest didn't work very well apart from carbon oil phosphate a little bit. Um, this is at pH 5.5 to 6. At pH 9, we got basically nothing. That's at 30 degrees. This is at 50 degrees. It hydrolyzes faster at warmer temperatures, but you also form it slightly faster. Um, and the beautiful thing here that I, I wanted to share with you is that it works for ADP to make ATP. But if you do the same reaction with ITP or GTP or CTP, so the other bases, the other, the other nucleotides that you see in DNA or RNA, you get, whoops, you get nothing at all. This, the, the dotted line is the contamination, this, so which we see a small amount of ATP in the ADP um, uh, preparation as bought from 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 uh, from from sigma um, but we make a lot of atp here we don't make anything else so why is atp the universal energy currency it seems in part because you can simply make it in water with a ferric ion catalyst ferric ion is the only one that worked under these conditions um, and, and acetyl phosphate so uh, it, it's I, I mean this is really i think beautiful work and, and 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 goes a long way to saying why atp is the universal energy currency um just for the last couple of slides i wanted to finish with the genetic code itself and how we might think about it and i i think i've just really got a few minutes left to speak so um this is pretty much the model that I showed you before, simplified down, because now we're thinking about splitting metabolism, making amino acids. This is AA1, AA2, these are amino acids, sugars, 
an energy currency like acetyl phosphate, fatty acids, and so on. And we're looking at nucleotide synthesis under these conditions. This is all theoretical with feedbacks. Um, so if you can make nucleotides, some of them can feed back on CO2 fixation. They may feed back on all kinds of other pathways as well. Uh, think about nucleotide cofactors here, which are still the cofactors for enzymes, or they could uh, favor their own synthesis. And what we found was that if nucleotides feed back here on CO2 fixation, you get a, a big increase in, in the rate of growth. Whereas if you feed back too much on any of these other pathways, it collapses growth. Um, you have a, either a very slow uh, increase, but generally with, with, with better catalysis, it collapses completely. And the reason for that is that it basically distorts, um, twists the pathways so that you have more flux down one pathway, less flux down other pathways. And to have growth of protocells, you need to have balanced growth. You need to have um, down all these pathways. And that means the best thing you could do is feed back on CO2 fixation and steepen the concentration gradient, steepen the driving force towards making everything uh, without much catalysis happening at all. Uh, and we found uh, that under those conditions, we're able to speed up protocell growth. But if, for example, you have direct feedback on on uh, autocatalytic feedback on, on, on nucleotide synthesis. You can concentrate nucleotides that way, but you don't grow very much. We're in this region over here uh, for, for protocell growth. So this gave us a set of conditions to think about. If you're able to make nucleotides, get better at making nucleotides, what, what would we then expect for the code itself? And here's how we think about it. And this is just the last two slides. And I won't say much about these, but you're welcome to ask questions. There are codes within the code. What you're seeing here, this is starting with CO2. This is uh, the, the, the core biochemistry of cells. And things in gray, the first letter of the codon um, is a G. Uh, and it's basically one step from a carboxylic acid. It's one reductive amination away from a carboxylic acid. Whenever you see that, the first letter of the code is always a G. Interesting. Um, uh, and the yellow, um, it's, it's one additional step away involving ATP, and it's always an A. Um, and the blues and the greens, we've not worried so much about them because they're further away. This is more, more biochemistry you've got to do. But they also correspond to where they are in, in the code. So there are these codes within the codons which have been known about for a long time. Um, and, and it's difficult to understand what they mean. But... Um, this is showing um, the minimum number of reaction steps. You can see if it's only a few steps, uh, you get a G. If it's a few more steps, you get an A. If it's quite a lot of steps, you get a C. And if it's the most steps with this being an outlier down here, um, then, then, then you have a U. So there's a, a clear correlation there. And this is uh, the second position of the, of the codon or the anticodon. Um, uh, uh, relates to the hydrophobicity of the amino acid it codes for. And, and this is actually using unbelievably 41 different um, indices of hydrophobicity. So these, these are plots taken from, a, a, because it's very difficult to estimate what the hydrophobicity of something actually is. And there's lots of different ways of doing it. And we've taken mean and range values for all of these. Um, and, and so you can see that there's a clear correlation um, with uh, G where, where G is the first letter of the codon, then the second letter, we see this correlation. If it's valine, these are the amino acids, valine, alanine, uh, glycine, and so on. Um, and this is uh, when A is the second letter. Again, we're seeing this strong correlation. When, when, the se second, when the second letter is a C or a U, we don't really see much of a correlation. So it seems as if there are biophysical relationships, at least for the first 10 amino acids. That implies direct physical interactions between amino acids and the second base of the codon. And even the third base, uh, which is often taken to be massively redundant, um, it, it's not redundant. It's not quite clear what's going on here, but we have inverted the standard codon table here. And so, for example, what you're seeing here is uh, this is the first position, the first base in the codon. This is the second base in the codon, and this is the third base in the codon. So this is what's supposed to be um, very redundant. And you can see that if, a, if there's a purine at the second position of the codon, then it matters whether there's a purine or a pyrimidine at the, at the, at the, at the third position. And we can predict based on size alone which amino acids 
will be coded for if there isn't redundancy at that third position and, and, and that also applies up here a little bit as well so it seems and this is early days where we're, we're, we're trying to make head or tail of this still but it seems that there are patterns in the code that imply both temporal and biophysical relationships um, between amino acids and the codon, or more specifically, the, the anticodons that are coding for them. And if you take that through to, um, to, to simply think about how can the code originate in that context, and you're thinking about direct biophysical relationships in a protocell setting, then you generate a random string of RNA, and you would have a, a non-random association of amino acids with that random string of RNA, which would potentially, if they were to polymerize, using that as a template they would have function in the context of the protocell and so you would have selection in terms of protocell growth and so you have meaning from the very beginning right that's it i'm just going to tell you what i've said very briefly i think life is a surprisingly good guide to its own origin um it's we've certainly not proved anything here but uh, everything i've said i think is broadly consistent with it I think structure and flow really matter, the structure of these hydrothermal vents with these cell-like compartments in them, and the continuous flow of hydrothermal fluids and proton gradients across barriers and so on. They can drive the reaction between hydrogen and CO2 to make organics. That is growth, the continuous reaction, the continuous reactivity driving growth, the core biochemistry of cells, carboxylic acids, Krebs cycle intermediates. Um, so protocells can form spontaneously under those conditions. Um, and they're pretty robust under those harsh conditions. And we can get uh, the iron sulfur clusters that life still uses today for CO2 fixation, which can potentially drive their autotrophic growth. Much of the core biochemistry of cells, including nucleotide synthesis, including even things like ATP synthesis, um, can occur spontaneously. We've not nailed all of this yet, but we've certainly got enough that makes it look very promising. It can work under these conditions. And, and we can understand, at least in principle, how a genetic code can arise under those conditions through direct biophysical interactions between amino acids and short RNA strands. And really, information comes into biology through the context of growing protocells. Cells come first, the code comes afterwards. Uh, and perhaps that's the best note to leave it on. Um, lots of people have been working i've i've had a good run uh, it can be very difficult to get this kind of work funded but in the last few years i've, I've been very lucky uh, to be funded by bbsrc uh, epsrc often for phd students uh, even gates ventures for a little period um, and, and i've had some wonderful students uh, and it's been a, a pleasure working with them and uh, it's uh, they are brave it's it's uh, these are questions that re require some commitment uh, and 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 there's a danger that you may not find anything there's a danger everything might not work so uh, i i take my hat off to them i'm very grateful to them for coming and working with me and for trying to test some of these ideas i think we've made exciting progress so and thank you very much uh, for, for for listening